Okay, well, we've come to our, our very last panel of the day, and I'm really excited to be able to present a panel which is about Mars Society Australia and its members and all the, the wonderful research and activities that people are engaged with. So thank you uh, in advance to everyone who's come along to present today and a big thank you to Earl White for being our moderator for this session. Thanks very much, Rowena. Thank you. So we are just going to change the order around a little bit to, to what was advertised. We'll, we'll have um, Dr. John Clark first and then Dr. Stephen Hobbs second, just so that we can help uh, Stephen to get away to another engagement. But uh, thank you very much and over to you, Earl. Thank you very much, Rowena. A wonderful opportunity to, uh, to present to the wider world, wider space community, what the Mars Society Australia is is involved in. This this body is, uh, I suppose, a uh, place relative, you might say, to the, the Mars to the Mars Society Australia. The people who are involved in it are interested and fascinated by space, and particularly the the topic of how do we get to Mars? What's there? What's what's the future hold? Both for the, this uh, our, our nearest planet that we can actually stand on, and also our, our role there. So, look, without further ado, and I know we we push for time, I'd like to. Switch over and uh, hand over to Dr. John Clark, who's the, uh, the longtime president and director of the Mars Society Australia. John's got a, a presentation about the Mars Society and uh, we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Thanks, John. So Mars Society Australia, who are we? What do we do? And why should you be involved with us? First of all, what are we? Well, we are a incorporated uh, limited liability company incorporated in West Australia. We are a non-profit and we have approved research organization status, uh, which basically means that any investment or donations to our research projects are eligible uh, for tax deduction. Uh, our three main goals are, first of all, broad public outreach to instill the vision of pioneering Mars. That can mean many things. It can mean a fora such as this. It can mean radio interviews. It can include talking to schools. It can include things like science festivals. Secondly, we exist to uh, lobby government agencies in Australia and indeed around the world to be more proactive and to continue ongoing Mars exploration programs, uh, both crude uh, and, uh, and robotic. And lastly, we do our own Mars research on limited funds. And I'll be talking about examples uh, of that a little bit further on in my course, in, in my talk, and hopefully people will ask uh, questions about it. All of these things link together to a vision of a human future on Mars. And so as that background illustration indicates, this involves boots on the ground. Robots are cool, robots are useful, they're indeed essential, but the real goal is, if possible, to have people exploring on the surface of Mars, living on the surface of Mars, but because despite all of the challenges that proposes to uh, how we live, some of which were covered in the previous uh, conversation, in the end, if we are to really explore Mars at a sort of detail and level that we explore our own planet, we need to be there in person. Membership of our society is open to all interested in Mars, um, especially those who want to make a personal contribution, uh, be they students, teachers, communicators, uh, be they scientists, engineers, tradespeople who want to do research and build stuff, uh, and also general space enthusiasts and member of the wider members of the wider public. Um, there's no age restriction, there's no qualification restriction. If you're interested in Mars, you're welcome on board. So what sort of things do we do? Well, first of all, we are involved in expeditions. And here are some photos from uh, some of our uh, recent expeditions. For example, on the top left uh, is uh, our visit uh, earlier this year uh, to lava caves in Victoria uh, near Biaduck. Uh, south of uh, Hamilton uh, in Victoria. Lava caves are of great interest to planetary researchers, uh, particularly on the Moon and Mars. Uh, they're also of interest to astrobiologists. And we have some very nice examples here in Australia, particularly mainly in Victoria and in Queensland, which we can use to develop and test ideas that people have about the utility and significance of lava caves. And we had on that expedition um, a NASA scientist, uh, Dr. Jen Blank, uh, who has been part of the NASA Braille program, developing uh, the tools uh, to explore uh, caves on Mars, uh, particularly in connection to the astrobiological significance. On the same trip, we also looked at a number of impact craters. This is uh, Henbury Crater Number 7, 
uh, south of Alice Springs, um, a relatively small crater, 180 meters long. It's three amalgamated craters very close together. Uh, and the other craters in this cluster are smaller still. Bottom left, we have a view near the Sokar Salt Lake at Ladakh at an altitude of four and a half thousand meters. And this is a magnificent Mars analog that we have been working with our colleagues at Amity University and other institutions in India as a place for uh, research and teaching in planetary science. And the bottom right, we have Lonar Crater also in India, one of the very few terrestrial impact craters into basalt, which is a predominant composition of the Martian crust and the lunar crust. And, and it has a lake in it with all sorts of extremes living in it. And it is fed by a groundwater for uh, groundwater uh, discharge uh, coming in on the right-hand side there to form a delta. So all sorts of interesting Mars analogs there, particularly with the Ezero crater, where the Perseverance rover is currently exploring. Second thing we do is analog missions. Uh, we have significant expertise at two stations uh, in the U.S., both, both the U.S. Mars Society. Well, one is in the U.S., MDRS, and uh, one is in the Canadian Arctic, FMARS. So at MDRS, we've had uh, 22 participants from uh, Mars Society Australia, spread over 13 crews, uh, accumulating 683 crew days. I see there's a mistake in the next one. We've had three people from Mars Society Australia participate over two crews, accumulating 77 crew days at the Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station on Devon Island. And shortly in January and February this year, uh, we'll be sending two further crews uh, from Australia and from India as well, partnering with them, uh, including uh, Steve Hobbs, who will be talking uh, later in this uh, in this program. Um, just uh, for those who are not familiar with these stations, MDRS, which is illustrated there, is in Utah. It's grown from the initial central habitat there to a campus that includes um, sheds uh, for outdoor storage, uh, greenhouses, uh, two different observatories, one a nighttime observatory, one a solar observatory, uh, and um, a science uh, science dome that uh, both holds the battery system for the solar power supply uh, and also a range of laboratory equipment. Uh, the other one is, of course, in the Arctic uh, on Devon Island, the world's largest uninhabited island and a great Mars analog used by both um, uh, the US Mars Society and people affiliated with them and by NASA. We also do research and development. And I think Steve Hobbs will be talking about more about this. Here's a uh, high altitude balloon flight that Steve's been extensively involved in developing sensors. If you go up 30 kilometers from wherever you are, you're essentially in a Mars-like environment in terms of radiation levels, temperature, atmospheric pressure, ultraviolet, flux, and so on. And we're also involved in analog EVA suits, Mars suits, and testing pressurized EVA suit prototypes. James Waldy, who I saw amongst the audience, has been involved in some of that. Uh, we've also been involved on these analog expeditions and in other, other programs, things like workload show, uh, scheduling, the challenges of doing field science while doing a simulated EVA, how much can you actually do when you're wearing a a uh, pressurized suit, um, interactions between drones and astronauts and their utility and drilling technologies. Some of this work has been done in conjunction with the European Space Agency and also with uh, the Institute for Biomedical Problems in Moscow. Uh, and that, and, and that, then there's the actual scientific research there, expeditionary psychology and sociology, stromatolites, signs of early life on Earth and how we might find them on Mars. And there's a possibility we actually have already. Fluvial sedimentology and diagenesis, geomorphology, landscape evolution, remote sensing, Steve Hobbs side again, endoliths and hyperliths, stroke streak, human factors, study of glacial and periglacial activity. Strong geological focus there, which reflects my own bias. I'm a geologist. And in fact, we've had a number of geologists on our expeditions. And coming out of these expeditions, uh, there's been a lot of public engagement raising the profile of Australian engagement in planetary science, human spaceflight, and contributing on the journey to Mars. This is just a, a, a series of screenshots that came out of the Mars 160 expedition back in 2016. Uh, some of them I did, some of them Annalee Beattie will be talking again later in the session, some done by other people. When we do this sort of work, there's a lot of interest and we can spread to the wider public how lots of questions are raised by uh, human space exploration, particularly of Mars, and also how those problems can be addressed and what we in Australia are doing. 
to address them. Uh, one technical program that we've been working on for the last 20 odd years has built to build a analog station uh, in Australia. And in support of that, we have actually developed, uh, the late Dave Wilson and myself, um, developed a, a Mars reference architecture that was based on the Mars Semi-Direct proposed by Robert Zubrin, the regional founder of the Mars Society in the US, uh, but incorporating a number of features around our requirements in Australia for our proposed analog station, and also a number of operational improvements, including uh, using a horizontally landed spacecraft rather than your traditional vertically landed ones, um, which makes it easier to move infrastructure around on the surface, dock their various modules together and so on. Uh, this was peer reviewed and published in 2007 and has been quite widely, widely reviewed. And here is the station that we want to build at Arkarula in South Australia using similar sized uh, modules. Uh, we've been trying for 20 years to do this and uh, the main obstacle obstacle is funding. So if anyone's got a spare, you know, one or $2 million, please contact me. Uh, this will be a platform, not only for Australian students, Australian scientists, uh, but also for people from overseas to come and study here as well. And using uh, the experience of places like the Mars Desert Research Station, it will probably be fully used during the field season. Just a quick shot of the interior, two deck structure, accommodation for eight people, complete has its own galley, its own laboratory, uh, hygiene facilities, and the second module it consists of a engineering uh, section, which is a nose of the module, which would have batteries for the solar power system, various equipment for the field work. Uh, and the second one, which would be docked onto the habitat, um, is a garage and, uh, and storage space. And there's another perspective view of it there. So what's our impact? Uh, more than 50 reviewed, peer-reviewed papers and five books have been produced by Mars Society Australia um, or its members. We've supported about 10 graduate level students. Uh, apologies if I missed out on a couple of people there. We've had significant uh, um, national and international media presence at various times, significant national and international conference presence. We've supplied analog hardware to education and research institutions uh, on a contract basis. Basis. We've made presentations to NASA, European Space Agency, the Australian Space Agency, and the Institute of Biomedical Problems in Moscow. Uh, we're currently partners with Amity University in India at Mumbai in the Astrobiology Program, provided guest, guest lectures at multiple universities, and we contributed to things like Science Week, the Science Festival in Brisbane, uh, Science Alive, and so forth. Why join? Well, if you join, you can be part of all this. You also gain a discount registration for the annual Australian Space Research Conferences. You can take part in our activities, both locally and nationally, or even internationally, and volunteer to help work in our projects. You can help finance our technical program, contributing to the body of knowledge required to send humans and in other and robots as well. Uh, and by the way, these are tax deductible. And you get to meet others involved in the human journey to Mars. There's a significant collegiality involved in being a member of the Mars Society Australia. There are contacts and I will uh, now hand over to our chair for any questions or discussion. Thanks very much, John. We've had one question about, uh, do you need to be Australian to join? Uh, no, no, we have we have members all over the world and uh, um, nobody off world, but hey, we're working on that this point in time. Yet. Yet, yet, yes, very true. It's, very it's, true. Worth, it's worthwhile mentioning that, at least, that two people who are involved in the analog programs in the Mars Society have become astronauts. Yes, that's true. And have flown in space. So if you're serious about becoming Becoming an astronaut, um, being involved in the Mars Society is something that will look good on your CV. And one other question was about where this um, base will be built. Um, it's being built in Arkarula, which is in the South Australian outback. Apart from, I suppose, the temperature very close as uh, Mars analogue uh, is you're going to be able to get on the, uh, the the surface of the Earth. It's a long, long way away, but still within, shall we say, shooting distance and of um, Adelaide, which is a major centre in uh, one of the capital cities of the states of Australia. And the, the beauty of, of, of that location, we, we could have a chat later on, is the, the geological structure um, of the area is quite unique and it has a thriving space and astronomical community there anyway so it's a, it's a prime site to uh to to build anyway look uh, uh, there's one more question there earl uh, a little bit it was a little bit earlier yes. by ariane um about mars themed space camps for children this would be a fantastic thing there are there's a south australian space school that has in-house sessions at mars simulations and also the victorian space science education 
uh, centre in Melbourne that does the same thing. I suspect for all sorts of uh, legal and safety uh, reasons and the qualifications of, the, of those doing it, a space camp in the field would need to be done through them. Uh, the Powerhouse Museum used to have a similar program as well. So yes, okay. they're out there. Okay, look, thanks for those. We might move on to a presentation uh, from our next, next panelist from Dr. S uh, Stephen Hobbs. Now, um, Stephen's going to talk about a very interesting project that he's been working on, which is uh, this idea of a low cost hyperspectral sensor um, and how that can shape the, uh, the, the possible Mars exploration. It, it has some applicability to, uh, to Earth as well, but um, this exciting things that um, Steve's been able to, to put together um, using some very low cost hardware. So I think if we can uh, hand, hand it over to Steve, we'll kick off with the next uh, next panellist. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Dr. Steve Hobbs. I've uh, been a Mars Society Australia member for quite some time. Um, my talk's going to be around low cost hyperspectral sensors. Um, so what has this got to do with human space flight? Well, in order to travel to places on Mars that we want to visit, we actually need to survey and look at them first. Um, an example was the Mars rover opportunity that was deliberately targeted um, at a place that had a mineral called hematite on it that was discovered through remote sensing. Um, the remote sensor used uh, was used similar technology of this, what I'm going to be describing now. Um, so for hyperspectral sensors, um, they're really fantastic at trying to identify uh, minerals of interest where astronauts might be able to mine them, extract uh, water from them, um, build uh, living places um, and so forth. And uh, hyperspectral sensors are really good at really discerning the fine amounts of detail uh, within materials of interest. So what I did here was trying to work out whether such a sensor could be built, which traditionally um, as little as 15 years ago would be quite sizable, would occupy a dinner table and be worth uh, millions of dollars and extensive testing required. Can something like that be tested um, and developed to a small cube chat sat uh, mission to put it in the affordability range of something like a middle power such as Australia could actually launch. Um, so to do that, I used the systems engineering techniques, I looked at custom trade spaces, um, space related hardware, and doing some old fashioned verification and validation and testing. Um, in this case, as Dr. John Clark talked about, um, our high altitude ballooning. So looking at the requirements what do we actually need? So the overall constraint is that it needed to fit into something like a 6U CubeSat, which is about the size of three loaves of bread stacked end to end. Um, so the challenge is, uh, should I choose to accept it, which I did, was designing a payload which was low power, had a small volume and small weight constraint simply because we couldn't exceed what the CubeSat could actually um, provide us. Also looking at um, a spectral area of the electromagnetic spectrum called red edge. Um, we actually care about red edge because um, in a terrestrial sense, it teaches us a lot about vegetation health and climate change. Um, and on a Martian sense, many of the minerals that we're actually interested for astrobiology um, implications and even extracting water from such as gypsum, hematite, iron oxide, um, have distinct spectral phenomenology um, in this end. Now, the grand plan was to actually do this in a laboratory environment. However, this was all done on a COVID-19 constraint of budget and laboratory space. So a lot of this was as much about trying to develop um, minimum viable product um, with the minimum burden on resources as, as anything else. Some other things to think about with bars and our remote sensing was talked about briefly um, in the ethics of health around the privacy concerns. Remote sensing in this context depends on the sun. When you're out around the orbit of Mars, you're getting less than half the amount of sunlight as you are here. This obviously has implications on how much um, power you can draw from your solar panels, but also how much energy is available to 
for your detector. And anyone who's ever taken a photograph and underexposed it will know what I mean there. So looking at the, I guess, what was possible and feasible in the in the budget and, um, and schedule constraints. So I ended up landing on what's called a field programmable gate array. These have actually been quite popular. They're fantastic devices in that not only can you update the code for them, you can also update the programming and the circuitry. They're really good for software defined radios and their very nature makes them more resistant to space radiation, which is a critical concern to space. The hyperspectral sensor works through a series of lenses and optics, which I'll show in a future slide, but essentially to, to minimize the complexity of the design, the sensor actually moves along in a straight line and develops a spectral image worth hundreds of bands in doing this just for context all of the colors that you will ever see in your entire lifetime are based on three colors red green and blue this hyperspectral sensor can return um, hundreds of individual colors which means you can really distinguish between different types of minerals. Just for context, there was a, a colored filtered camera alongside to take some context images and really to help uh, facilitate interpretation of the hyperspectral returns, which can become quite complicated. So using the custom trade space, which for the sake of time, I won't go into here, but we landed on commercial off the self components, A, because they're quite affordable, B, something that's come out of the space 2.0 and the mobile phone rev revolution has been mass production of these things, which means the cameras, in a, even in a commercial sense, have um, very finely constrained engineering parameters. So their performance pretty much has to be spot on to the point where they're actually rivaling uh, scientific instruments if they're treated in the right manner. So on the left there, those are the two sensors that were chosen, um, a monochrome sensor, um, replete in the 3D printed um, push broom sensor on the left there, um, the sensor in the middle of the picture there, and a essentially a mobile phone um, color camera to the right to provide those context images. Now for hyperspectral, um, we're dealing with engineering, we're dealing with technology, things have to work and you have to do a whole bunch of things in the right manner um, for any sort of meaningful output to be produced by your instrument. This is one of the many things that I had to do. This is a raw, on the left hand side there is a raw spectral image of a fluorescent light. If you ever hold a prism up to a fluorescent light uh, with a slit in front of it, this is what you would see, a whole series of bands. It's really cool because those bands occupy it by the same uh, wavelengths over and over again, which means you can calibrate your image. Unfortunately, they come out with what's called a smile, which makes them curved on the left. So the first thing I have to do is do some post-processing to make those curves line straight. Once we do that, we then need to do um, a bunch of calibration because what we're interested in is the spectral signature of the mineral. We're not interested in the spectral signature of the sun, plus the spectral signature of the atmosphere, plus the spectral limitations of the sensor, which when you take a raw spectral sample like this, this is exactly what you're getting. So you have to extract all of the information you don't want to be able to obtain uh, what you do. And here's a little bit more detail on the process there. So on the left-hand side is how it works. It's essentially a telescope with a slit in the middle and a diffraction grating. And towards the left of the left-hand image there, you see the lens and the detector of the imaging sensor and the light source of reflected energy is on the extreme right. On the right-hand side of the image, um, you'll see a custom uh, calibration target that I used. Jim Bell's actually done this for quite a few generations of Mars images. Um, there's a nice picture in his um, postcards from Mars book, which shows this. You have a whole bunch of um, things that you basically stick on a, um, a board or a piece of cardboard. You light them up. In this case, I use the sun because it's a known spectral source. All of the items you see here, which is some rust there towards the right, some mud stones, some green leaves you can see there, all have known spectral signatures, which means I can compare the performance of my instrument and also the multi-spectral camera just to see how, how things are going. And this is what these graphs are showing. So the blue graph is from a almost $100,000 professional instrument. 
and the orange graph is from the custom-made hyperspectral sensor. The closer the blue line and the orange line are together means the better that the sensor is performed. Um, so what these graphs are showing us is that the um, sensor performed quite well across some, um, some color swatches courtesy of a hardware store. The three little spikes down the bottom mid center of the image there are measuring uh, what's called spectral resolution. That means how many wavelengths per um, spectral image this thing is sensitive to. And the narrower the lines, the, um, the better the sensor. And so again, this sensor performed quite well. Moving on to the minerals. So some rusty iron, um, Mars is full of iron oxide. So I chose that. Mudstone, uh, hematite. Um, hematite's been discovered on Mars as described earlier. Gypsum, uh, olivine, and around the middle there, just for context, um, I chose two vegetation samples just because they have very specific uh, spectral returns around this wavelengths. And again, the instrument performed quite well. Um, so it was satisfying the requirements. Moving to the multispectral camera, um, doing similar things, comparing the, I guess, the exposures with the, um, again, the professional spectral instrument, the higher this R squared number is, or the closer it is to one means the better that the instrument is. And as you can see here across the five channels, blue, green, red, um, a red edge and a near infrared, um, the instrument performed quite well. And again, here's some graphs um, comparing the five band multispectral camera, which is a color camera with a field filter wheel in front of it, as you would see with the Spirit and Opportunity Rovers and Mars Pathfinder. And you can see it's performing quite well against the minerals, um, which meant that that camera would show utility um, in a Mars environment. So moving on to the real cool stuff, uh, question number two was great. We've got all of this um, low cost commercial uh, sensors. How well does it perform in a Martian environment? Um, so courtesy of Robert Brand, uh, we took a multi-spectral -cam multi camera up uh, to near edge of space. And here's an image of the balloon being inflated and launched. During the flight, there are a number of sensors which recorded pressure, temperature, um, some color values, and also the G-forces acting on the payload. And what we're seeing here is the pressures and temperatures got down to what you would actually find in an elevator period of Mars. So around the maximum altitude of this balloon, these sensors were exposed to a Martian environment with increased radiation, near vacuum, and frigid temperatures. Interestingly, on the bottom right-hand graph, you can see what happens when the uh, balloon quite nicely ascends and then bursts, and then the payload experiences quite a rough time coming down until it actually hits the ground. Uh, here's an image from maximum altitude uh, from the northern uh, uh, regional New South Wales. So we're up 34 kilometres. Um, the sky is black and the earth is round. I checked. Um, here's some multispectral images uh, from the ground uh, at various el um, altitudes, just showing the cameras was actually able to provide meaningful information while we're up there. Essentially, that's the presentation. So what we've been able to achieve is we now have a low-cost hyperspectral sensor which can, which can fit on a small Mars rover or a CubeSat and we also have a multispectral camera at the two sensors have been demonstrated to work in a Martian environment. So thank you. I'll hand over to the chair if there's any questions. Thank you very much, Stephen. That's a fascinating discussion. Tell me, um, do, you, do you anticipate with the advancing of advancement, sort of particularly of uh, camera sensors, which is going to be occurring in the next few years, that you'll see um, even better resolution um, and better capabilities for your devices in the near to short term? Uh, short answer is absolutely. The laws of physics do get in the way a little bit. Mm. But it was interesting to note that when I started doing the trade study of this two years ago um, to now, a whole bunch of sensors, which I actually found to be useful, are now obsolete. You can't get them. And now there's a whole bunch of new ones, which just literally float, wipe the floor with the older ones. So absolutely. And one question we had was, there was there any student involvement with um, the uh, design of the CubeSat? Or was that something that was handled by you and the team there? Um, so the short answer was yes. And the slightly long answer was, I was actually the student. It was something that we um, did try to pursue um, we did have some student involvement during some robot testing um, that we undertook in Arkarula, funnily enough, back in 2014. But for this one, this is something we would actually like to explore moving forward. 
All right, look, thanks for that. Um, now, all, a lot of these materials, by the way, are available um, on the Mars Society website. If any of the, and that's marssociety.org.au, I think it's been mentioned in the chat already. If there is anything that you'd like more information on, please contact us directly because we'd be more than happy to, to supply that for you. Um, thanks for that, Stephen. I think our, our next uh, guest could be a quite an interesting presentation. Um, another longtime member of the Mars Society, Dr. Annalee Beatty, is going to talk about, we mentioned before about analog research stations. She's going to talk about the planning for one of the sessions or the cruise for um, for a place called the dark so if you'd like to jump into the fray uh, Annalie and uh, we'll listen to your session hi everybody welcome uh thanks for asking us to come to this panel uh it's a great pleasure to be here and to talk to you today about planning for the dark um so I'm an artist who works in space science and uh, today I'm going to talk about analog studies, Mangaliatri, and our, how our expedition to the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah in February will help us build a science desert research station in Ladakh, India. So Mars Society Australia has a long history of analog research in extreme environments. In the last decade, uh, we've worked with institutions and organisations in India and elsewhere to jointly field space science crews to sites in India that have similar conditions to those you might find on other planets like Mars. So we travel to Lanar uh, Crater, which, as John mentioned, is a basalt crater similar to Jezero, um, on per where Perseverance is on Mars right now. And so here's my painting of Jezero. Uh, we've journeyed to the salt flats of the Great Round of Kutch, and we've been part of the science expedition Naswood NASA space would bound the dark. Um, we've also collaborated with the Centre of Excellence in Astrobiology to run three Earth space exploration programs to the high glacier deserts of Ladakh. Uh, as John mentioned again, he and I have both been faculty adjunct professors at the Centre of Excellence at Amity University for the past few years. And next week online, uh, I'll be joining him to meet Amity students who are studying in the first ever postgraduate course in astrobiology. So my point is Mars Society Australia has um, a commitment to astrobiology and to analogue studies in India. And next year we'll return to Ladakh. Ladakh is a very whole, cold, very high altitude desert region, 3,500 to 5,700 metres above sea level. It's located in the eastern part of the state of Jammu Kashmir of northern India. Because of its high altitude, Ladakh has lower levels of oxygen in its atmosphere and high levels of UV radiation. It usually receives little rainfall and experiences large fluctuations in temperature between seasons and between day and night. Its glacial deposits and regions, dunes and intra-dune ponds, hot springs, saline lakes and permafrost regions are high altitude environments for off-earth analog and astrobiology research. In this harsh environment, uh, breathlessness and atox ataxia are common and it's often difficult to move around. Analog research is goal-directed and controlled, useful particularly for field science as it puts constraints around the science goals, um, those that relate to what we can learn from terrestrial environments and how we work in them to think about extraterrestrial environments. Yes, uh, again, as John mentioned, we do wish we could build our own analog station at Akarula. Here's Steve Hobbs' impression of our MSA research station. Um, we have US 200,000k as a start donated from the Mars Society US, but we do need to find the rest of the funds. In the near future, however, we hope to build a science desert research station in Ladakh, which will ensure analog studies in India and help us further understand how we might live and work together on Mars. With this in mind, in February 2, 24, MSA will send two crews, crew 291 and 292, to the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah uh, to explore what it might be like to live in simulation in the largest and longest running Mars surface research facility on Earth. MDRS is one of two research facilities offered, operated by the Mars Society US. The second is Flashline Mars um, Arctic Research Station and in the Canadian High Arctic, uh, Andrew Wheeler, who is commander of our first MSA crew, Crew 291, has just returned from an expedition to Flashline. The Utah MDRS facility is built on an ancient erg on the edges of the San Rafael swell in southern Utah. It hosts an eight-month field season training for human operations on Mars. 
The relative isolation of the facility allows for rigorous field studies as well as human factors research. And areas includes, <clears throat> excuse me, a two-story habitat with a greenhouse, solar and robotic observatory, an engineering pod and a science building. Although much warmer than Mars, uh, the desert location was selected because of its Mars-like terrain and appearance. MDRS aims to realistically simulate Mars living conditions. During mission periods, crew members must wear analog space suits, simulators uh, when completing tasks outside their living quarters. Um, the HAB itself is a um, tornado proof metal building with an airlock. So in February, we'll send two crews to the Mars Desert Research Station. And the second crew, Mangal Yatri, is the one I'd like to talk about today. Mangal Yatri means Mars Explorers in Hindi. Uh, at the station, our crew will live in close proximity and simulation in a Mars-like landscape in a remote desert. We will eat dehydrated food and only leave the habitat in full space. So it's, I actually think the cooking is so much better than that, but um, <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good photo. We did actually eat that. Uh, whilst under surveillance from media emission control on our rotation, team members will carry out field and laboratory work as part of a crew, a multidisciplinary crew, at an analog planetary habitat at the same time in a controlled task-driven space in a harsh and extreme environment. Um, our primary focus is survival and safety while simulating a crew on Mars. The advantage of a space simulation is it's a try for something, allowing for asynchronous role creation that accounts for the individual kind of experience that each of us brings to the situation. Um, apart from individual research at MDRS, in simulation, our goal is to think about what we can learn from these systems and from the science operations in Utah to apply this knowledge to future work in Ladakh. In Ladakh, we do have a site in mind for our station and permission from local people to build. And the conceptual design for the Ladakh station is well underway. Our Mangalyatri crew will focus on how to inform design with an understanding of infrastructure and operations. So now I'd like to talk to you about our crew. Um, we'd like to build an optical tracking station in Ladakh at MDRS crew executive officer and designated crew astronomer Aditya Krishna Karachiri Madhasudan will formulate comprehensive plans and effective strategies for the construction of an observatory in preparation for the upcoming analog station in India. In addition to this, his secondary objective is to make use of the MDRS Musk Observatory to capture and analyze potential solar events, which in turn will provide a deeper understanding of solar phenomenon and its implications for space travel and exploration. In terms of the science, Mangalyatri aims to characterize life in extreme environments and advance the understanding of the limits and constraints on life. Um, as well as define protocols for future successful planetary scientific exploration. Um, the science goals examine patterns of biodiversity and distribution of organisms within geologic microhabitats in Utah, those that might have analogues on Mars. As the science lead uh, of MDRS Crew 292, Bharti Sharma's mission is to study the geological and geomorphological features of Utah linking them with the terrain of Ladakh and Mars. Equipped with field analysis and remote sensing techniques, her primary goal remains the comprehensive understanding of terrestrial analog sites to bridge the gaps between Mars and Earth geology. As the crew biologist and health and safety officer, Daniel Loy's project will focus on recovering and extracting DNA from halophiles and other extremophiles to investigate the functional and taxonomic diversity salt deposits and other ga gathered samples. Daniel will also mo develop, modify, employ and employ field appropriate cultivation independent techniques. This will involve the use of the Bento Lab, a portable centrifuge, gel station and PCR machine in combination with hot start PCR polymerases, PCR primers for an array of biogeochemical cycling genes and the MOBO DNA extraction kit, which will be modified for application with reduced facilities. Daniel will combine techniques to provide the baseline of fundamental cultivation dependent isolations and cultivation independent techniques, uh, DNA extraction and PCR, 
that are achievable under mission parameter mission analog mission parameters. This will then form the methodological framework for training and protocols that could then be carried out by non-biologists for future crews at MDRS and at the Ladakh Research Station or on other locations. These techniques are low cost and sustainable and carried out long term and they don't depend on reagents with a short shelf life. Claire Fletcher will undertake research for their PhD while at the Mars De Desert Research Station and uh, they are participating in both Crew 291 Expedition Boomerang 3 and Crew 292 Mangal Yaktri. Claire's PhD focuses on exogea conservation of Mars, understanding important geological sites and features, particularly potential evidence of life and paleo environments and how we can best protect them while allowing for continued exploration. The key outcome, pardon, the key outcome of Claire, Claire's time at MDRS will be to create a method to determine in situ what astrobiological features need to be protected and how to best do that. The purpose of this study is to come up with a way for astronauts and mission teams to effectively consider exogeo conservation as they explore and sample without necessitating extensive reconnaissance for every location or outcrop. No such studies have been conducted before and there's currently no best practice for scientific sampling that takes into account the protection of vitally important study features on Mars while still allowing for sampling. We have two engineers on our crew. Raji Patel will utilise her engineering experience to routinely monitor equipment used by the crew and repair them, maintain and repair them in case of systems failure. Her duties include providing daily status reports for each piece of equipment. In addition, she will conduct research that primarily focuses on propellant production, utilising water-bearing minerals at the Mars Desert Research Station. Such propellants could decrease the cost of interplanetary travel and prove to be an additional source of propellant for the space exploration crew. Winfrey Paul Sagayan Dennis is currently pursuing a dual master's degree in aeronautics and astronautics, as well as mechanical engineering at Purdue University. Her specialization lies in systems engineering and human factors. During her time at MDRS, Winfrey will develop and implement an improved proactive maintenance and monitoring framework, which we can apply when building a science desert research station in Ladakh. This framework will enhance the crew engineer's ability to ensure the station's optimal functionality, better aligning with the Martian environment demands and constraints. Apart from sharing the role of crew engineer, uh, Winfrey will also conduct research on human factors, specifically focusing on how isolation and confinement and the extreme environment of the landscape and habitat impact adaptation. Her research will encompass areas such as vigilance, assessment of mental workload and spatial orientation. Uh, drawing on her internship experience with Cummins air filtration, Winfrey will also address air quality concerns within the MDRO station, leveraging her experience in this area. On our journeys up into the Himalayan mountains in Ladakh, our Earth space, space science ex expeditions explored field sites that might help us understand the past of the planet, the evolution of life, the effects of climate change and how we might train for exploration of the moon and Mars. In 220, Prathima Muniapa traveled to Ladakh and was part of ESCP2, designer, conservator, and research assistant for the Space Enabled Research Group. Prathima's PhD research at MIT explores group cultural identity as an ecological manifestation. Her research on this rotation will culminate in a performance piece which aims to consecrate rather than desiccate space. Manas Javin trained as a GM geoinformatics professional at the Energy and Resource Institute School of Advanced Studies, Lay. She's a member of the Ladakhi Science Foundation. Uh, geoinformatics is an interdisciplinary branch of science which, which deals with cartographic visualization, GIS, remote sensing, photogrammetry, spatial statistics, multivariate statistics, and other advanced tools and techniques. Manaz will help us bring all our information together. She's able to contribute in all kinds of spatial analysis using different geospatial techniques, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. She can generate maps and provide valuable contextual information for science and, and for our planning teams. In Utah, she will primarily focus on the green hat. Her own interest is how we might combine traditional Ladakhi nomadic knowledge to establish a greenhouse in Ladakh 
where natural vegetation grows and survives in winters where temperatures drop to minus 20 degrees. Both Ilan Kuzhali, Ilavazaran and Sakshi Sharma are ground control and outreach crew members and they will communicate with us from India as remote mission support. They will, re they will raise awareness of our Mangalyatri rotation to MDS through social media and outreach events. So that's our crew. Our external directors are Dr. Siddharth Pandey, who was originally um, to lead this crew before his move from JPL to full growing Perth. Dr. Anushree Srivastava, who has recently taken up position at the Carnegie Institute in Washington, and Dr. Jen Blank from Blue Marble Institute. Jen is a, an American geological fellow and PI on the NASA Brow Project, which investigates which investigated science, robotics, and science operations in the lava caves in North Cow. My own role on this mission is commander of the crew. Apart from this busy job, I hope to draw the dark sky at night and I will invite our crew to join me. I also have a drawing project in mind that addresses through drawing the nuances and the complexities in uh, what constitutes a frontier environment looking closely at concepts of wilderness and free space. On expeditions, I'm always thinking about our collective responsibility to both the human and the non-human and the potential of art as a catalyst for change. My aim here is to broaden our understanding of how we imprint onto worlds that are not our own, how we might develop an ethics of reciprocal responsibility through drawing, one that can be translated elsewhere uh, to Ladakh and when we travel off Earth to Mars. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, any questions? Thanks very much for that, uh, Emily. That's it's a remarkable location, and um, I think people are going to be just amazed at the spines and learning about how how to live off planet that's going to come from that. And the amazing thing too is um, when you look at it, we we had some questions in the chat about what are you know what what do the students get from this? Um, you can see they have remarkable opportunities to to contribute in all sorts of different ways, and, and no, nobody goes there with the same same aim really. It's a it's a re really cool thing. Um, one, one question that they did pop up with, with the Ladakh project any idea of how that's going to be funded do we have a, an idea of of where the, the money is coming from that yeah no I've got no idea where, how we're going to fund okay. it all right, maybe guess, something for it. You know, something for another time we can talk about, perhaps. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So, um, do we have any other? Any? I'll just take a look at the chat here. Any other uh, questions we can we can um, raise before we we move along? All right. Okay. Look. Thank you so much for that, Anneli. That's that's yeah. been uh, that's been really amazing. So, uh, the next uh, the next uh, presenter is Dr. Shane Usher. Shane is another long term member and and contributor to the Mars Society in Australia, and. Um, He's going to talk about controlling confined spaces and analog research, and I think you'll find what Shane's going to talk about is, is really it's, it's a really relevant topic because let's face it, when we go to space, there's not a lot of space. So anyway, I'll, I'll hand over to Shane. Hi everyone, I'm Shane Usher, a research fellow in chemical engineering at the University of Melbourne, and yes, I'm talking about confined spaces for analog research and. As um, we're, we're all hoping in my lifetime and yours, someone will land on Mars. But for now, we're still stuck preparing on Earth. So just a little bit of background about myself. I'm a chemical engineer and a chemist. I've done a little bit of rowing and my motivation here is really to help to facilitate an enduring human presence in space, expanding our frontiers in the solar system and eventually beyond. And the challenge of extended missions in space involve the obvious three of radiation, vacuum and gravity. And wherever we are, we need to maintain a breathable environment that can sustain humans and potentially pets and animals as well. So I've uh, had the privilege of being involved in some analog missions. So at the Mars Desert Research Station, I was part of Expedition Boomerang. And then I also was a potential candidate for a, a four-month analog mission at the Institute of Biomedical Problems in Moscow. I'll tell you a little bit about them. And following on from that, with our isolation in Australia, I've been developing a walk-in refuse chamber that uh, we can use as a confined space for maintaining people for potentially analog missions. 
So for Expedition Boomerang in 2019, which um, I had the privilege of being part of, um, thanks to Mars Society Australia and the Mars Society, we got to experience 16 days in an environment where we looked at uh, what it's like to be in an isolated area and simulate being in, in space where the environment outside is not breathable. Now, inside, it, it's fa fairly realistic, but outside, it's um, more of a psychological experiment when you put, put the, um, the, the space suit on. But there's a, a, lot, a lot that we went, went through over those 16 days, and there's a lot of learning. My personal interest there was looking at how all of the control systems work together to maintain a, a breathable environment, whether it's in the um, in an in EVA suit or in the uh, the chambers where you where you have to live on a day to day basis. At the Institute of Biomedical Problems in Moscow, they have a facility they call the NEK. Don't ask me to pronounce the Russian. My um, my Russian is still quite quite rough. And um, what what uh, that does, it controls the atmosphere at a positive pressure of about three kilopascals. And in, in these cabins there, you, you live and um, do all of your experiments, a bit like being on the International Space Station. And they had six people in there for uh, four months and, and more recently an eight month mission where they do a whole bunch of different experiments, a lot of uh, psychological and uh, biomedical experiments. And while all that's happening, they maintain the environment within there to keep it safe. Now, back here, it's a bit like Big Brother with 78 carat moves watching you the whole time. And um, you get to go on EVAs or moonwalks or Mars walks, depending upon the color of the uh, simulated regolith or soil at, at the time. And um, what I want to do is develop a facility that doesn't have the high cost of putting it all together. So let's just think about confined spaces. So at Ladakh, which is uh, halfway up, almost halfway up Everest, the pressure would be significantly less than it is at sea level. And um, this is probably comparable to the highest soccer stadium on earth at La Paz in Bolivia, where the uh, pressure is 65% of what is it at uh, sea level. At Everest Base Camp, you might get to half the pressure. And when the pressure is halved, so is the oxygen concentration. And for, if you want to go any higher than this, you, you definitely need uh, oxygen uh, breathing assistance. Uh, you can go up um, once you get into aeroplanes. A lot of the aeroplanes that we that we deal with uh, are sealed cabins, so that the the air that you breathe is 75% to 100% of the normal pressure, even when the air outside might be at 20% uh, or less. And when you cross the the Kármán line at 100 kilometres, you're in into the areas of space where the pressure can be extremely low. Of course, you can go down in pressure when you're scuba diving. You can go down to just with a small depth of 40 metres, the pressure can be five times what you'd normally experience on on the surface. And of note here is the Titanic wreck at 3.8 kilometres down, where the pressure is 38 megapascals. So that that is of order 380 times the pressure that we have here on the surface. That's uh, that, that's pretty extreme. Now, the history of confined spaces for humanity has been a long one. The, the, the general need is to, to find caves, buildings and homes that are dry, warm, sheltered. And uh, as you, you find those places, such as a cave, you want to make sure that the, the, the waste products don't build up and what you need, such as oxygen, doesn't deplete too much. So you have to think about smoke, smoke and other pollutants that might build up in addition to carbon dioxide. So you need airflow to bring in oxygen and remove pollutants. Uh, we, in houses, we developed heating systems, chimneys, air conditioning, all sorts of things to control our environment. In spaceships and space stations, we have controlled environment. We want to look at the volume of the that you actually have to live in, the pressure, the temperature, the relative humidity, the oxygen concentration, carbon dioxide and methane. Yes, we all fart. And we, we need to keep that under control and keep it safe. On the International Space Station, there's about 388 cubic metres of habitable volume. 
and the carbon dioxide pressure is supposed to be kept at two and a half thousand to five thousand parts per million, which is about ten times the normal concentration in our everyday lives outside. Now that can get higher, and that that's hard to maintain. That's one of the challenges. So, a new space station on the block, the Tiangong space station, the Chinese station, put up there or or started to be built in 2021. It has a habitable volume of 122 cubic meters, and um, we're, we're not sure what the CO2 con concentration is in there, but uh, it's certainly of interest. In submarines, it's very deep and you want to maintain one atmosphere of pressure so that it's it's not too, so that you can actually survive in that environment. Sometimes the, the pressure will vary and the crew will have to acclimatize to it living day to day at a different pressure. And if the vessel that you're in can't cope with that pressure, those uh, those that equipment can can basically um, collapse, such as the Ocean Gate uh, submersible that was headed towards the, the Titanic recently. Uh, the smallest confined spaces that, that we generally work with for, for humans have, uh, have a bit of a history as well, such as the Japanese divers off broom looking for pearls, diving suits for, for scuba, breathing apparatus for fireys, uh, self-containing breathing apparatus, and uh, extra I think I'll get the acronym wrong, extra mobility units for uh, spacesuits to go for spacewalks, whether it's um, in a space station or on the moon. Now, there have been a number of fatalities looking at uh, training even in 1967, uh, both Soyuz training and Apollo training. And in 1971, there, there have been deaths with uh, crews there have been a number of deaths of crew members. Of course, the more famous ones that we all know about are the two Space Shuttle Challenger explosions or rapid unscheduled disassemblies during launch and re-entry. What's of most significant um, interest and concern to me is the, the earlier ones where there was a high oxygen environment and there was fire. Uh, other areas of confined spaces where there's issues or in mine accidents where you have cave-ins, explosions, and suffocations, that's certainly of interest here because this is um, something uh, that they have uh, refuse chambers that I'm going to be uh, talking about. And in, in any kind of confined space chamber, there have been a significant number of fatalities over the last 50 years due to fatal fires and oxygen ignition. So if I'm going to develop an analog confined space system, that's one of the hazards that I really need to look out for. My concept is an outback airlock where you can be in an environment with uh, controlled pressure in addition to the other environmental parameters so that you could simulate riding a bike up a mountain, playing sport at altitude, climbing a high mountain or taking a spacewalk. Uh, what we have here, an infographic showing the, the kinds of uh, environment things that we need in this environment so that you can spend a day inside, perhaps uh, simulating riding up a mountain, running at altitude, day rowing up high, or maybe a day in space. Of course, um, maybe you need, need to get used to that for stormtrooper selection. When you're in there, you need to look at the, the, the pressure, the altitude, the oxygen, carbon dioxide, temperature, humidity, and that's just for the environmental control. You also need to keep keep an eye on the, on all the crew members, looking at heart rate. If you're using some exercise equipment, you need to look at the um, the, the power output, the distance that you're covering. You might need to look at the blood oxygen concentration, keep track of that if you're doing exertion under what would be unusual atmospheric conditions, such as lowered pressure or oxygen concentration. And there's a, there's a whole bunch of medical, potential medical issues that you need to keep track of continuously, such as dehydration, pain, nausea, heart rate, fatigue, hypoxia is one of the issues that you have if you have a lowered oxygen concentration. And um, in terms of what we have in terms of facilities for low oxygen concentrations here in Australia, we have Mount Stromlo. There is a, uh, a thermally controlled vacuum chamber, but that's not for human occupation. Uh, there is a, an expensive hyperbaric chamber at the University of Tasmania. Picture there is Dr. David Cooper, who showed me around there. It's a fantastic facility, and they are hoping soon to use NASA protocols to test lower pressure environments. 
What am I doing? I have a mine refuse chamber. So this is designed to keep a number of people, in this case, 16 people alive for up to 36 hours in the incident in the case of a mine issue deep down. And the concept is that um, it's a shipping concise sized or transportable isolation chamber that is uh, affordable for research groups and transportable. And what, what we have here is a system where it already has an air conditioner and a carbon dioxide scrubber to maintain the temperature and the, the carbon dioxide concentration. What I'm adding is a, a, a kiln, not necessarily within there, but the scrubber is a calcium oxide material that then needs to be regenerated at uh, up to 900 degrees Celsius. And I have a kiln for that purpose. Uh, systems that we've added to control the pressure, a vacuum pump, an oil-free scroll pump to maintain a constant supply of air through the system where necessary. We have a, an oil-free compressor and dehumidifier is extremely important. As soon as you're in there for a little bit, the humidity gets very high and an oxygen concentrator um, can supply oxygen for, for breathing in certain situations, but the waste stream of that concentrator can provide a, a lower oxygen air stream we desired. In terms of monitoring, there's a whole bunch of things that, as mentioned, you need to monitor. The, um, you need to have visual connection with the outside world through a security camera and, and uh, other other methods. You need to monitor the temperature, humidity, pressure, composition of the air, and any outputs from any exercise equipment. And uh, one method that I have to monitor the, atmosphere, the atmospheric properties in more detail is a mass spectrometer. And in terms of commissioning, we're uh, back on a, a reinforcement of the structure so that we can cope with up to 15 kilocastles of, of pressure and We've uh, done a, a small test to work out where there are potential leaks at the moment and resealed some of those areas. And what we've found is that uh, if you just put one person in there, it can you can last for more than 60 minutes before the rel before the carbon dioxide concentration goes above 5,000 ppm. But it's much less than 30 minutes if you're doing uh, intense exercise. So the, the scrubbing is very important and it gives a time scale of uh, how long you can survive in there with the intense exercise before this before the environment be can potentially become unsafe. Some of the applications that we're looking at are confined space analogs, altitude research and training, equipment testing, potentially even Mars analogs and physics experiments and spacesuit testing. The next generation of this will be a shipping container that will have a main change chamber and, and an antechamber so that you can maintain a constant environment within the, the main area and use the antechamber to come and go, which will have some added benefits. Uh, I'd like to thank people at the Institute of Biomedical Problems, at, uh, everyone with Mars Society and Mars Society Australia and Hobart Hospital, and uh, a few people who've helped me, Ali, Mark and Glenn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shane. That, it's, uh, it's a fascinating project. Well, well two, two really. I think part of the, you've already answered part of the question, which was who's going to use it. I, I'd imagine there'd be some sort of fee or charge, particularly when um, you're, you're using it for certification and validation of spacesuits and that sort of stuff. Or is that yeah, something so, that's a bit, yeah. So so um, at the moment, it's personally funded and where there's research involved, if it's something that I can collaborate with, then I, I'm prepared to bear the costs of the funding. Where it is more commercially involved, then uh, something reasonable is uh, where arrangements can be made. Come, come to an agreement. Sort of thing. Okay. Um, and another thing, talking about the, the challenges in developing or for that much marketing, the mine refuge chamber. Have you got any comments on that? So I don't think marketing is is really the challenge at the moment. The challenge is for the, for this system, it's to develop all the system, all the control and monitoring systems to the point where it can sustain someone for an extended period. So beyond having the port loo and a little bit of food, you want it to be a sustainable environment where you can keep, keep people alive there for an extended period. Once you're at that point, then it's a candidate for, for a good number of studies. 
for the, uh, the, the the next version, which is based on a shipping container, it will have to be a certified pressure vessel and requirements for a pressure vessel for human occupation are reason, reasonably um, extensive. And some, some key parts of that include a deluge system. And when you have a deluge system, then everything that's within the chamber will need to be intrinsically safe. Thanks for that. We might, uh, any other comments from any of the other presenters or uh, about the, the um presentation. All right, look, thanks for that, Shane. Um, as the afternoon's getting on, we might might move along to our final Mars Society presenter, uh, Dr. James Waldy, and uh, yet another very long time contributor and uh, member of the Mars Society. Um, when we go to Mars or when we go outside of the Earth's atmosphere, we need we want to move around. We need to be in a spacesuit. And James's organisation is a uh, leader in developing uh, spacesuits for Mars. So now I'll hand over to James to to talk about uh, space suits for Mars. Thank you, Earl. Uh, pleasure to be here. I'll um, try and keep this pretty quick and pretty brief, but I'll be talking about spacesuits for Mars. Um, not only um, the space walking suits that we all know about, the EVA, the extra vehicular activity suits, but also IVA suits, the intra vehicular activity suits. So let's get on with uh, with EVA suits um, <clears throat> and IVA suits from a skin suit perspective. Uh, we all know that if you take a piece of elastic and then you try and stretch it, uh, there's a force that tries to restore it. And essentially, we're using those properties to try and create force on the body. The more you, you the more you stretch, the more the restoring force. We can align and engineer that stretch um, in different axes on the body to create different loading parameters. Uh, the two main are in the axial direction. And that is where you would create a suit that is shorter than you are, so that when you put it on, the force is axially applied um, and it can create load uh, in the vertical direction, in the in the z-axis, if you like. And the other one is circumferential loading, and that is if we design a suit which is too thin for you, if you like, and it tries to squeeze you uh, and make you smaller. Um, and that applies pressure, much like what atmospheric pressure does to us. But there's lots of things that we need to consider when designing uh, skin suits. One of them is mentioned here in the properties of elastics, and that is that if you pull a piece of elastic, say, five centimetres longer than it's trying to restore it a sort certain force, then you can pull another five centimetres to 10 centimetres, if you like. And then often, if you're in that linear phase, then it is twice the force that's trying to pull back. What's really interesting is that if you then return the elastic back to that five centimetre stretch point, then the force that's trying to return itself is much less. And we can sort of talk about it on this hysteresis graph here you sort of pull it out to say five centimeters you're quite high force up to 10 centimeters almost about twice but then in this case when you're when you're traveling back down and you get back to that same strain point then the force is much lower and that makes it difficult for instance when you're trying to design ankles on suits for instance because it has to stretch further over the foot and then it's on that returning and hysteresis point so you have to be considerate of these sorts of design aspects the other thing to to concern yourself with is is Laplace, which is the, the main definition of the imposition of pressure on the body. And that is that the pressure or the compression on the body is related to the tension in the elastics and the local radius. So if you have a perfectly round cross-sectional limb, for instance, a finger is pretty pretty round, for instance, then you'll get sort of equal compression all around because the local radius each, at each point uh, is about the same. But unfortunately, if you have uh, an oval cross-section, then where the, the area is flatter, then you get less pressure. And where is more rounded, then you get more pressure. And we see that in lots of places on the body, for instance, on the hands, you know, the cross section of the palm is a lot like this. Um, uh, on the back of the hand, you have low uh, radius. And then on the palm, you actually have a, a dip where you have a negative radius, if, if you like, in this, in this instance. And therefore, the elastic sort of bridge across and you don't get any compression. There are other challenges too. Um, and that is, you know, here on the, on the right side of, of the screen, which can be good and bad if you apply compression from a circumferential perspective, um, then you can actually round the limb off and therefore you start to average uh, the pressure back and you don't start to get high points and low points because you're rounding the limb. Um, but there are also challenges when it comes to 
through maintaining the size of your body. And of course, microgravity exposure causes substantial changes to your anthropometry. You have fluid shifts, which are the major influence there, also muscle atrophy and spinal elongation and, and, and other impacts. But it's very difficult to be able to know exactly how your body will change with microgravity exposure. And so you can design the perfect garment during launch, but then uh, only after a few days, few weeks, perhaps, then that perfectly designed gar garment will not be imposing the sorts of design compressions that we want. So let's start talking about EVA suits. And of course, these uh, amazing engineering accomplishments, they're essentially body shaped balloons um, filled with breathing gas. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when you pressurize uh, such a suit, it's like a balloon and it becomes incredibly stiff. And so in order to try and create some mobility there are complex joints and also the pressurization is very low down to about 30 percent of an atmosphere at, at pure oxygen when we start to look at martian suits and what is currently considered for the moon and also for mars at nasa and also at some of the other sort of traditional suit makers uh, we have the exploration emu the x emu the exploration extravehicular mobility unit um, but where we start to see concerns is that they are becoming even even more heavy um, and multiple times heavier than what we think is the limit for what can be used in the three-eighths gravity of Mars uh, and where this was passable perhaps for very short durations uh, for lunar ex exploration and EVA uh, at only one-sixth of a G in three-eighths of a G this will just be too much. Uh, they're extremely stiff. Um, they are also cause numerous injuries which I'll go into on the next slide. Um, NASA has always has already invested uh, um, 400 million today to now Collins and Axiom are taking on uh, some of their research and developing it further. But um, there are some substantial concerns, not only that these will be okay and be produced in time uh, for Artemis lunar landings, but the very premise of gas pressurization um, does not seem to be congruent with the requirements for Mars. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But there, here's some of the injuries that we don't really hear about um, from gas pressurization suits and and it's really quite interesting to see that even with the partial data that we have, um, that there's an injury rate of three and a half percent. And while that doesn't sound too high, when we look at the number of EVAs that we would want to uh, execute over a Mars mission, uh, you know, 45 would result um, in injury and 21 percent would experience some sort of problem. Um, now, this is, of course, statistics where each EVA is separated by a period of time where there's very careful preparation, not only in the logistics um, and the operations of each and every EVA, but also in the, the suits before and afterwards. The cadence of EVA for a Mars mission is incredibly high and would not enjoy that sort of preparation. It would be more organic uh, rather than hugely pre-planned. So the, the suits would need to be tolerant to that sort of on-demand type EVA. And with the data that we have so far from gas pressurization, it's just simply not suitable. 30% um, of the lunar surface EVAs resulted in some sort of injury as well, if we start to talk about terrestrial applications in particular. So one of the modalities of suit pressurization, if you like, that's that's been really interesting, uh, but always simmering around this sort of unfeasible premise, if you like, is, is mechanical counter pressure or, or skin suits. And that's where we start to apply some of the principles I talked about before into applying some sort of square squeezing atmospheric type pressure to the body. So instead of having gas um, pressurizing your body like the atmosphere or like a gas pressurized suit, then you have elastics uh, which are squeezing your body, except around the head traditionally around the um, you have the whole body covered in elastics except for a gas pressurized helmet of course to breathe you're breathing at about 30 percent of an atmosphere again approximately the same as the gas pressurized suits and then the rest of you is compressed physically at about a third of an atmosphere and that's where you have mechanical counter pressure and these have been around for a long time some prominent uh, ones have been the space activity suit by dr paul webb and found some incredible advances with mobility and lightness and reduction in bulk safety because you can scratch it or and it 
only remains a local defect rather than a full body depressurization. So there's, there's clear benefits there. But getting it on and off was a, was a concern. Uh, and also that uniform compression aspect, which, which we've talked about uh, earlier on before, which is that challenge of using elastics to try and create a somewhat uniform compression over the body. It doesn't have to be perfectly uniform. It is incredibly rare for any of us to be exposed to uniform compression on our body. We're sitting down, so we've got pressure on our on our backside when we're standing up, pressure on the soles of our feet when we're grabbing things. We've got higher pressure there on the palms of our hands. We've got clothing compression when we're carrying things. There's more compression, so it doesn't have to be perfectly uniform. And we're doing some studies to work out exactly uh, what those physiological constraints are in uniformity. Uh, but these sorts of suits are in incredibly uh, difficult, especially in concavities like the backs of the knee and underarms, groins, things like that. And also in the transition uh, from the elastic into the gas pressurized elements. Um, MSA has been doing um, quite a bit of work in the past uh, through the Maskin project. Uh, here's John uh, top left here and, and myself, we're using a Honeywell concept MCP glove uh, as part of our Arca Ruler expedition. And we did studies on the mobility of the hand uh, when doing mock EVA uh, activities, such as um, uh, geological sampling, but also engineering activities. And we found that an MCP glove was about 1.65 times longer to do tasks in those gloves, but with a simulated gas uh, glove, it was about six times longer. And that seems to to confirm what, what others have found with gas gloves. Um, so that gives some indication of how much more mobility MCP provides over gas pressurization. If we look at what the Mars requirements are, in this column here, the ideal Mars suit, compared to all the sorts of properties that we can give to and to what we can uh, describe a suit to have and to what we want it to have. And then we can compare it with gas pressurization and then with MCP. Then it really describes the case very clearly and pragmatically why MCP suits are far more suited uh, than gas pressurization. And you can see that we have all sorts of demands for a Mars suit. Um, and if we add up all these scores here, then we sort of get to a 42 and a half. But if we score a gas pressurized suit, then we get to 22. And if we use an MCP suit here, uh, then we get to 34 and a half. Now, one, one of the other things that, that's really worth considering also is the type of MCP suit that we're talking about because it doesn't have to be the classic full body elastics with a gas pressurized helmet. Uh, there are all sorts of hybrids that are available. Maybe you just want to do the limbs in MCP and you have the, uh, the head and torso as gas pressurization, or maybe you want to have uh, some sort of system where it's half of the compression is done by MCP and the other half is by gas pressurization. And, and in doing so, you can reduce the amount of, of gas pressure and therefore try and give uh, even even more flexibility to, the, to that stiff and existing gas pressurization suit. So there's all sorts of, of hybrids. And we went through a program to look and do a trade study on what was best. And we found that essentially it's that full body suit with small augmentations at those concavity sections was the best mix of pros and cons with having that full gas pressurized helmet. And that's what led to this concept um, that we developed under the Australian Space Agency last year, which was exactly that, which is that sort of augmented MCP suit style. Here's the cross section, and I don't have time to go into it all and our concept there. And this was some of the work that, that John uh, worked with as well. And uh, these are the sorts of suits that we've done through the, the Mars Society as well called Mars Skin, which looks at creating analog uh, MCP suits. Uh, and we've deployed these um, on various missions, looking at mobility, as, as we said before, but also trying to rise to the challenge of creating a mock suit that, that sort of looks the part, it makes researchers feel the part when they're outside, but it also tries to recreate the challenges that you would have if you were really doing research on Mars and really inside some sort of future uh, suit. So that looks at, at all the sorts of restrictions to movement and also the, the total mass imposition that you have and also the change in, in CG and so forth. So that's a really interesting project that we have going on. And here's some other studies that I'd commend uh, you have a look at just some recent recent work. Um, one was uh, this uh, report that we've done for human aerospace 
uh, and written by John uh, under the Australian Space Agency. And this was also some of uh, a master's student uh, that was also as part of that base agency grant, uh, Abby Rudikov, uh, looking at the different architectures and what would be ideal for Martian EVA. And it's really up to us following this to try and to try and progress this and to try and understand where uh, concepts and, and where Axiom and Collins and NASA are looking to progress when it comes to Martian EVA technologies and to try and provide some sort of um, input and some real pragmatic and, and, and learned wisdom into those sorts of those sorts of studies. Um, but for IVA suits, uh, these are intra-vehicular activity suits, and we see them for launch and entry and so forth. But there are also a number of suits that are used to try and retain the health of astronauts in uh, due to microgravity exposure. Uh, the Pingvin uh, is quite well known, but these other suits, orthostatic intolerance garment, um, and also the Chivas lower body negative pressure. Uh, these suits all about trying to uh, reduce that tendency that blood cannot be pumped up to the brain when you're transitioning to a higher G environment because of adaptation. And that is uh, that causes faintness and dizziness and so forth uh, and was um, considered a, a real challenge, especially for shuttle pilots, but they're only really exposed to, to two weeks or so of, of microgravity. But let's go through some of these. Uh, one of the first and primary concerns was was uh, was bone loss and and related to that um, stature increase uh, back pain herniated discs but also you know getting up to close to two percent a month bone loss in microgravity and that's really uh, significant when you start to look at the sort of two and a half year mission times for Mars so what we need to do is try and restore normal loading on the skeletal system you know a lot of the current countermeasures for that is the treadmill and and countermeasure and exercise and an advanced resistive exercise device but but none of these devices will be on uh, considered now for future exploration class, items class missions. They'll all be replaced by a flywheel device, which contributes far less loading onto the body. So there, there is some concern amongst people about future missions. And even though bone loss on ISS at the moment is pretty low and is sort of considered solved or mitigated, if you like, in the, in the future, that will not be the case. Um, and so we've been looking at uh, the gravity loading suit, which was designed to try and reproduce that gradual increasing load on the body that you experience when you're standing up on earth so so your shoulders are being loaded by your head and your and your neck and your arms hanging off them and as you go down the body then that that vertical load starts to increase and increase and increase and increase when you get to the to your hips that sort of your whole upper body is weighing down on that point by the time you get down to your feet your your whole body weight is is weighing on your feet uh, the pingvin tries to incorporate some of this loading but the the sort of two-stage architecture of that suit doesn't really do that. But if you do it from an elastic point of view and you engineer the strain vertically, the stretch vertically, then you can you can create, you know, this green line here, which sits in most cases very closely over that blue normal loading line. And so that that really replicates that loading to try and preserve bone mass and really trick the bones into thinking that they're standing on earth when in fact they're just floating around microgravity. But what we also have to do to realize that is is also create some circumferential stretch so that we can start to apply the, that loading into the into the body, into the skeletal system in particular and so you have this combination in the gravity loading suit of both axial and circumferential pressure uh, this was um, my suit went up to the International Space Station in 2015 on Andreas Mergensen. It also went up uh, on 2017 uh, with um, with Tomas um, Pesquet. Um, and now we're we're looking to um, now we're working with NASA on progressing it on to be able to test it on a much larger number of of astronauts. But one of the things that we're struggling with is that perception that bone loss has been mitigated, and so therefore there isn't a, a real appetite to keep developing the gravity loading suit so but what there is is a great appetite to be looking at other aspects um, of or risks of microgravity exposure and that's where things like the um, where we can start to pivot and take the gravity loading design the skin suit design uh, for IVA and, and try and address other things and one of those uh, is uh, this risk on the human research program the risk of altered sensory motor and vestibular function uh, and you can see that there's it's it's a red and and um, you know we really need to um, when it starts to look at lunar and Mars missions you know it requires mitigation um, and it requires more research in order uh, uh, to satisfy the risks that they see, uh, sensory motor um, is a is a really significant one because that is where you start to 
control your balance and your coordination. Uh, when you're floating around in microgravity, uh, your limbs are weightless. Uh, you're not your feet aren't touching the ground. You don't have the same uh, mechanical stimulation on the body, and therefore um, that sensory motor um, system that you have and is adapted to to gravitational use uh, starts to decondition. Um, and when you return to gravity, then you lose your balance and your coordination. And that's particularly serious if in the case of an emergency landing and you need to have a fast egress or indeed if you have to try and have coordination enough to land a vehicle, um, then there's severe concern that your sensory motor system won't be up to the task. So what we've been looking at is a, a decondition is a is a countermeasure uh, to that sort of loss. Um, and it, it it does a number of, of different aspects. Um, really do, it applies um, targeted limb weighting, which is currently in prototype form, but are these external elastic straps. Uh, they'll be integrated into the elastics in, in future future versions. But essentially what they do is they provide resistance when you move, uh, which is the same as, as the resistance that we have when we move our limbs uh, on Earth. Uh, we also have surface pressure, which which stimulates the, the proprioceptive centers and those mechanoreceptors receptors all over the body, but particularly on the soles of the feet and um, uh, and, and, and around the body. Uh, but we also have axial loading, which again tries to impart some of that gravitational-like loading on the body. Um, and we would think that sort of a wearing protocol for these sorts of su suits would maybe be, um, you know, a few hours uh, a week um, during, you know, transit and then maybe um, ev every day in the, in the two weeks prior to transitioning into a higher G uh, environment. Um, the the other one that we're looking at is the orthostatic intolerance and really what you what we're doing there is um, we're trying to create a, a G suit if you like for astronauts and that is a suit which compresses the lower body very strongly and is able to resist pooling of blood which your body is not used to when it's in microgravity but when it transitions uh, to a gravi to to G then it, you're trying to resist that pooling of blood down in the lower body and to try and retain blood pressure um, particularly intracranially, uh, so that you don't start to get dizzy or faint. Um, so NASA have been working on a on a compression regime, which you know starts at sort of 55 millimeters of mercury, sort of at the feet, and then goes to sort of um, 18, 16 here over the ab abdomen. Um, and they have uh, a variety of suits that try to do this, um, but there's a number of challenges here. One is that is that um, in comfort. Uh, at the knee and the hip uh, is is very low, um, particularly when you're wearing these in the recumbent, very tight recumbent position uh, during re-entry. Uh, and also the sizing is uh, is very difficult because um, there isn't really a way to know that you're adjusting the suit so that it's applying the correct amount of compression. Uh, there's some sort of training before the mission and they say, just tighten it up so that it feels like this. And you go, oh, okay. And then, you know, three months later when you're trying to use the OIG, then, then you're just guessing what that compression is and you have no idea whether you're at that design pressure or not. So what we've been doing is we've been working on not only the base layer, which is a posture driven design of compression, uh, but we're also looking at these sorts of uh, adjustable bands. Um, and these bands are something that we're actually going through a patent process at the moment. Um, what it is, is it's very similar to a, a, a belt, if you like, but it's an elastic belt. What we do is we um, pull um, the belt through the buckle until we get to a certain color um, and that really sets what your current size is and remember this is totally non-related to your current size and then you pull the band through until you match that color on the other metric on the other side and what we're able to do therefore is to be able for the band to not only adjust to your current size but then apply the compression that you need for whatever part of the mission you want that may be a lunar or an earth or a mars mission depending on what sort of compression you need at that point on the body. And our sort of con concept for an OIG is this sort of posture driven base elastic layer with these uh, bands that are on on various strategic points uh, of the body where we know um, and, and which are sized according to that, that color system to be able to impart the perfect compression there regardless of how the body has changed due to that um, microgravity exposure. Uh, again, these are just prototypes here. These are just pictures, but these are you know, there's a number of
of ways that we can reduce the profile of these so that they can sit you know inside the other launch and re-entry suits and also be comfortable enough to wear around in the early days uh, during adaptation in that G environment of Mars. Uh, so that's about it. I've tried to go through that as quick as I can, but um, uh, thanks all for listening and happy to to answer a few questions there as well. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, uh, James. That's that's so much information there. Amazing. Just a couple of questions on this one. We've had some people um, pose to this. First of all, in terms of the skin suits, do they sort of have applications here on Earth? Yeah, heaps of applications. I've even started a company called Cape Bionics, which starts to apply a lot of the skin suit concepts for terrestrial use. Uh, the yeah. first application was in professional athletes, and we were able to scan the subjects and be able to create bespoke garments with very specific compression regimes for performance or recovery or travel or rehabilitation. Uh, we're just releasing that into the physiotherapy or physical therapy usage where physios and practitioners um, will have an iPad or a, an iPhone in their clinic and they'll be able to scan their clients and, and will be able to prescribe professional medical grade custom fit compression garments based on some of the sizing algorithms that we used for these space applications. Um, so um, I think um, then from there, we're, we're going to start to grow into occupational therapy. Um, also, we're starting to look at lymphedema, of course, and bespoke okay. compression garments there. Very looking common, burns. very common condition, yeah. yeah. Um, also, aged care. Uh, there's a lot of travel, um, you know, needs for DVT and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. Other, you know, um, orthopedic surgeons and vascular insufficiencies. So there's one thing that, that you know, I'm really passionate about is, is, is not only being part of these amazing pioneering missions, in outer space, but to to apply what we've learnt for terrestrial benefit as well. So there's a there's there's that huge application, yeah. And that, that's that's uh, I suppose common with any sort of space program or or anything we develop for space. The the um, both the anticipated and often the unexpected um, spin off technologies that we've done some wonderful things here back here on Earth. For, you know, it's uh, amazing. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, and, and one other question too. Uh, and this is from Shane. Is the uh, does the air pressure affect what the body perceives as loading? So in other words, if a change in air change in air pressure does do we sort of does the body perceive that as a change of loading? So yeah, an interesting one. I think from certainly from a mechanical aspect, it does. You know, you can you can create all sorts of garments at different compression loadings, and you certainly feel that that difference in loading. And John will tell you, especially you know when the the EVA compression garments are at you know, thirty percent of atmospheres, so are 200, 222 millimeters of mercury, but the IVA suits are down very low, you know, 15, 20, 30 millimetres of mercury, which is what's commonly worn, you know, even the, the elastics in your underwear, you know, can sometimes be at, at some uh, around there, maybe 10 millimetres of mercury. So uh, you certainly feel that difference. I think when I've done experimentation from a, a pneumatic pressurization perspective in hyperbaric chambers and things, and you certainly start to feel the difference. One of the things that you quickly, that, that quickly happened to me is that you started to sort of feel tingling in your hand and then the lower pressure started to cause surface blood vessels to explode. This, okay. this, yep. this phenomenon, this um, petechiae, where you start to see bright red dots where the, you know, the, the blood vessels explode and looks really bad. It's not that painful actually, but it looks really bad and you can get a lot of sympathy from people around you are trying to look after you but so you, you can certainly feel it not uh, i guess from a different sense though i think it's an interesting question um from shane is that when you do it mechanically you you feel that that pressure but when it's when it's a difference in gas then you start to feel it in 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 other ways and from a from a thermal perspective uh, from a tingling and a and a um and a blood flow perspective yeah thanks uh, now folks have we got any other questions for James before we uh, before we wind up his segment? Nobody? Okay. Well, look, look thank you so much for that, James. Amazingly informative um, talk, as have been all the other panellists this afternoon. So, look, I'd just like to to quickly wrap up with special thanks to Rowena for giving us the opportunity to, as the Mars Society, to present this afternoon. You can see there's a wide variety of projects and research and, I suppose, dreams and ambitions that the, the MSA is interested in. If anyone wants to join us, you're more than welcome to at any, any time. We're... Uh, always welcome to uh, take both students, generally uh, interested members of the community, people involved in industry, people involved in academia, 
if, if you love space and you love Mars, uh, you know, please, please come on board. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And look, I'll, I'll hand it back to Rowena. Thank you so much, uh, Elf, for doing a wonderful job with the, the moderating. And thank you very much indeed to all, all our Mars Society presenters. I think there's not too many organisations that could quite easily put together five people with PhDs to talk about a very diverse range of research and, and projects. And I, I think that that, that that really speaks to the quality and validity of the work that Mars Society is doing and just what a great thing it is to be part of, of Mars Society and all these exciting ideas and prospects leading, leading towards the future. So thank you once again, everyone. And I really appreciate that it's, um, it's late in the day. So thank you very much for giving up a good proportion of your afternoon. And for those of you overseas, thank you very much for coming along at all kinds of odd times of the, the day and night. And I think we've, we've had a really great day and we have basically recorded everything apart from one presentation this morning so we will turn that into YouTube videos and we will put that online and share that with you all and it'll be open access so not not only for you but also for anybody else that that you would like to share the recordings with so that's basically a wrap for today but thank you thank you all once again and we were certainly the Melbourne International Space Festival, which is a new thing this year, has, has actually been a great success in terms of collaboration between different universities and different organisations, and everyone's really happy with it. So we, we are definitely hoping to do something even bigger and better again next year. So keep an eye out. We'll, we'll certainly uh, let you all know what's happening. And thank you very much, everyone. Deep, deeply appreciated. Thanks to you, Rowena. Thanks very much for organising everything to all the organisers. It's great. Great for me to join in. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Take care.